it's really difficult in families. You get divorced families, you get broken families, you get blended families, you get families where one parent has died, you get so many different sorts of families. But the family is the ultimate defense mechanism against the tyranny that we are being confronted with. So where does one draw the boundary between this idea of family? Like I got into a bit of a spat yesterday with this guy, Steve Laws. Oh yeah, I know on, Steve Laws. On social media. And he was talking about, you know, what are you gonna do about getting rid of uh, all of the foreigners? Right, you know, he has many good opinions, but many opinions that I would say are bad opinions too. But Steve Laws is a reaction to the, to the environment that he lives in. He's seen his country be invaded, uh, be destroyed, and he wants to return to what he knew to be good. But, f but for him, it goes further than it does for a lot of us. In that for him, he says, look, Britain is a white country for white people and everyone else needs to go. Now, of course, I would object to that because I'd say the genie's out of the bottle. I am half white English, but also half black Afro-Caribbean. Where do people like Steve Laws draw the line to be British? Doesn't doesn't matter what race or religion you are, as long as there's a predominantly British culture. There has to be one pri primary culture that everyone subscribes to. How do you think the <laughs> two-tier Kia and the Notting Hill Carnival and fit into modern Britain. They can't. If, if Carnival was not a predominantly black event, it would have been cancelled and banned and, and labelled as far-right thuggery. The fact that it's got away with what it's got away with, how many stabbings were there, how many arrests, how many sexual assaults, it was a horrible, horrible event. It should not be happening in this country. Yes, when it was set up originally, it may have been in a, uh, a kind of event to celebrate diversity, but we don't need to celebrate diversity. Uh, and it's become a riot. It's not a, it's not a festival, it's a riot. And if, if we, you and I were organising it, we would have been in jail. So the fact that the mayor of London says this is a great uh, example of multiculturalism and the fact that the prime minister thinks it's a great ele element of diversity shows that they are the problem. And actually, we need to get back to ha celebrating Britain, celebrating England, celebrating the things that unite us, not the things that separate and divide us. I, um, my worry, and it's a major worry now, as I look at Keir Starmer, is that we, we are getting, we're going to have five years of absolute misery with him and the best he can come out with is we're going to ban smoking outside pubs but if you look at his statement when he went on tv he said it's a preventable cause of death well yes so is abortion Two hundred fifty thousand babies die every year of, of a, from abortion it's the biggest killer we have in in the united kingdom are you going to ban that too of course he's not it's just political he's stretching his power he's stretching his muscles like a, a, an opinion on whether he's an extrovert or an introvert he couldn't say his favorite poem couldn't say what books he'd read like he has no emotion no personality he's just a communist automaton is if you do not have faith and you do not believe you are very open to this, uh, as Gad said, calls it suicidal empathy of the left, who are terrified of dying. Yeah. And they're is. terrified of dying so much that they want zero everything, zero death. We've been through this before. And I think that um, we, we now have an obligation to go to seriously think about what it is that we're going to be able via our network to offer people as an alternative because I can't see Keir Starmer's uh, regime coming to an end by democratic means. I just don't. Hello, and welcome to the first Fox and Father back from the summer break. I returned last night at two in the morning, thanks to some lost luggage, and uh, Calvin, or Lewis Hamilton, as we shall refer to him with his current beard, <laughs> is was back a bit earlier. Anyway, oh. it's lovely to see you all, and uh, and good to be back. Um, and let's start off. How are you, the father? I am good, thank you. It is good to be back. I've missed this. We tried to do one on the beach, but someone managed to disable themselves on the first day of their holiday. I'm not mentioning any names. But can we <laughs> can we show the footage of you trying to ski? You were skiing quite well, <laughs> and then, and then so, right. yeah. day one you broke how many ribs? Two. Yeah, <laughs> I do feel sorry for you, but at the same time, Lawrence, what are you doing? I was trying to be younger. 
<laughs> I was trying to do my younger self. I, I got off to my perfect war start and I was like, my beach start even, I'm like, I've got this nailed. Yeah. And you know me, I like to be very abstinent at lunch on oh, yeah. holiday. So I don't like to have any alcohol at all at lunch. Oh, so yeah. I was like, this is great. And then uh, I think my third turn in, I um, I I spoke to the pros actually, and they said that I that I had hit my ski, not my um, not the wave. So that's what broke the ribs. So yeah, I spent the whole holiday with broken ribs, but I saved some money on water skiing, which was good. <laughs> yeah, but, well, we had a great time, and I'm, I'm honestly, I needed that. That was a wonderful holiday for me. The epitome is when we're out on that boat like in the middle of the sea that is my my safe space right it's like the rest of the world doesn't matter all the stresses of home and twitter and tabloid press and all the all of it's just gone it's just you and the waves you're literally in god's hands and anything could happen but it's still you're at the same time you're at peace i love that did you hear about did you watch the rfk tucker um x interview no Ah, oh, so good. You're going to love this. I know that RFK has got a few dodge views on certain things, but RFK was talking about the fact that, um, and I want to know this from a biblical perspective, because you'll be able to tell me, he makes this point that the devil ascribes a number to everything. Right. Give it a number, you know, so like carbon, give it a number, too much carbon, too little carbon. Mm. But all of Jesus's uh, journeys and, you know, in parables are about nature. So all of us want to preserve our habitats, but we don't count carbon. That's what the devil does. And I thought it was so interesting that he said that the difference between a conservative conservationist, someone like us out on the sea going, we want to preserve this habitat, and a carbon capture person is the carbon capture person wouldn't want you out on the sea in the first place. They'd want you stuck at home eating bugs, yeah. wouldn't they? Yeah, there's a lack of realism to it, isn't there? There's the the idea that they well, they're pretending they want to save the climate, but really, and truly, it's about slavery. They're locking us down and making us serfs to the new autocracy. When actually, a human being is a steward of God's good creation. He gave us dominion over this creation, over this world, and therefore we are to look after it, but to enjoy it. To enjoy it, we really enjoyed it. I love. I mean, you, you are my favorite holiday companion of all time, other than Lizzie, obviously. But you are my favourite commander companion of all time because you, you are the man of 15 words a day. That's, that's what true. I call you. Calvin says 15 words a day. Yeah, when I'm at peace, that's it. I'm just relaxed. When I, holiday mode is holiday mode. <laughs> but no, it was great to spend time with you and the kids and also Lizzie and her kids as well and getting to know everyone. That was, it was nice to see your, your families combining. It's like, because you talk about this on the show, you know, quite a bit. And it's nice to see it in practice. This is what the Christian life is. It's about family. It is. We forget it is. And that actually, it is the fundamental of, of everything. <laughs> and we can see it in the things that I kind of want to talk about this week. I don't know what you want to talk about. I've obviously, I didn't get off a plane because I didn't give them my luggage until like three in the morning. Wow. And so I'm knackered as it is. But um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was um, the family mm. and the fact that it's really difficult in families. You get divorced families, you get broken families, you get blended families, you get families where one parent has died, you get so many different sorts of families. But the family is the ultimate defence mechanism against the tyranny that we are being confronted with at the moment. And people, I put out a message today on the um, on our thing saying I'm going to speak to Calvin, and a lot of the messages were, what do we do about this? What do we do about all of this? And I wanted to know, and my, my instinct told me immediately, it was families are the answer yes, to this. But, but also problem. remembering that we are a family. So the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. And that often gets perversely twisted into blood is thicker than water. But actually what, what that means is that Christians are brothers and sisters in Christ together, sons and daughters of God together. And that is our immediate family. And then we have our biological family too. And then we have our wider parish and wider community. But first and foremost, we're related through Christ. And that's where we get our camaraderie. That's where we get our encouragement. That's where we give each other faith uh, and support each other through him, through his love and his strength and his courage. So where does one draw the boundary between this idea of family? Like I got into a bit of a spat yesterday with this guy, Steve Laws, oh, yeah, I know on, Steve Laws, on social media. And he was talking about, you know, like 
Britain, what are you going to say about, I don't want to do an impression of him, that's not fair, but you know, what are you going to do about getting rid of uh, all of the foreigners? Right. So, you know, so, uh, and uh, he came across to me as an ethno nationalist. Well, he is. is. I, I think he would admit to that. And, you know, he has many good opinions, but many opinions that I would say are bad opinions too. But Steve Laws is a reaction to the, to the environment that he lives in. He's seen his country be invaded. Uh, be destroyed, and he wants to return to what he knew to be good. But f- but for him, it goes further than it does for a lot of us. In that, for him, he says, "Look, Britain is a white country for white people, and everyone else needs to go." Now, of course, I would object to that because I'd say the genie's out of the bottle. I am half white English, but also half Black Afro Caribbean. So my mother's side in the family is English all the way back; always has been. My father's oh, side of the family, time world champion, uh, racing car driver. But shut up. But my dad's <laughs> side of the family are from Jamaica and therefore from Africa at some point. And so I am, both, both my parents were born here. So I am British by birth, but British by, well, English by half of my heritage, but half my heritage isn't. So where does pe- where do people like Steve Laws draw the line? Do they say, okay, well, you're, you're not entirely white, therefore you need to go. And if that's the case, then go where? England is all I've ever known. It's, it is my. I mean, I have English culture, British culture. I don't have Jamaican culture. My my dad's dad was from Jamaica. Good for him. But I'm from here. So you know, wh- where do you draw the line? Well, I don't know because where do you draw the line with our good friend? Well, not good friend. Our demonic, uh, evil bastard Axel, who killed the three girls, who apparently is from Wales. You know right. where where does one draw? So you know, I I, I it's really difficult because. On the one side, I can see where Steve Laws is coming from, which is like you've got to have a clear, definitive de- delineation yeah. of what is and isn't British. Yeah. Because the left will use that as a way of saying, oh, a man from Dartford called Abdul Aziz Rahmanonov, you know, um, it's like, no, you're not from Dartford, mate. But, but then you become so, a reaction. Steve yeah, becomes a reaction. Right. He's not an original idea. Um, Andrew Tate actually put, or was it Tristan Tate? Yeah, I think Tristan Tate put out a tweet that said, look, let's, all these millionaires, let's buy an island, like similar to my idea, but slightly different. He said, let's buy an island and go back and, and put common law from the 1960s and let's have Britain as it used to be. And I think what he was saying there is that actually to be British, British doesn't doesn't matter what race or religion you are, as long as there's a predominantly British culture. There has to be one pri- primary culture that everyone subscribes to. And, and England from the 50s and 60s, after there was some immigration, but not mass immigration, worked very well because people assimilated. You know, my, my father's father assimilated and became part of the community. It didn't matter what they looked like. And that's that's the difference of, of where the trap that people like Steve Laws fall into. I know lots of ethno nuts on, on Twitter. I, I pushed, you know, I, I think we have to push back against that ethno nationalist argument because otherwise you get into puritanism of 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 well what the 1930s germans were into to be, to be honest with you what about um so emma rock who is my twitter fave uh and follow her anyone who's watching this she's amazing she's lovely uh, talking to her on the phone this morning because i find myself as always checking in with people that are open and public about their general despair about this stuff I was talking about the island and she calls it GB2. And I really love it. And and I, do you know what? I think if we just took the American Constitution and right. put it on GB2, yeah. and we were all walking around with revolvers, yeah. it would just is be it, fantastic. Is this, the, this my island she was talking about? Well, I don't know whether it's your island, but this is how I want to make island. this island. <laughs> anyway, they... Because we haven't really talked about the, the island, the, the Torsa Island, uh, uh, the the one where the crazy Mohammedan tried to buy it, he got rejected, and so I set up a crowd fund. If like if we manage to successfully buy this, only one point five million pounds. So everyone donate five pounds each, and we'll have it. If we manage to buy it, we'll have a safe haven, a Christian retreat where. How big is it? Sorry. It is about it? 270 square, was it meters or cube? The measurements are all way crazy. Anyway, it's on givesendgo.com forward slash torsa. So it's quite big and there's only like a few, there's a handful of buildings on there. One of them is a place that people can stay in straight away, like a guest house. But there's room to build a chapel, there's room to build a monastery, there's room to expand it and actually create something there. I don't know if we'd be allowed to walk around with revolvers because it would still be under probably Scottish law. But there's the scope GB2, there to do something. GB2. We start GB2. in an entirely new country. All right, let's get Emma Rock involved. Let's do it. I think it's good. I'm this ready to start this, an entirely The answer new is the Benedict option. We've talked about this loads of times. Like you, when you moved out of London to, to, to actual England, we talked about this. Like we have to build 
Christian communities again. We have to live amongst Christians. We have to kind of be separate to the world, but just close enough that the world can see there's a better alternative. And that's what we have to, we have to create that because it doesn't exist. What, what do you make of, um, you know, while we're on the topic of, you know, the fact that the England that we know doesn't exist. Yeah. I mean, it, five years ago, yeah. three years ago, the Notting Hill Carnival would have been an entirely acceptable thing to take place in Great Britain. But yeah. following um, Keir Stalin's takedown of the, um, the you know, these rioters mm. and these protests and all that sort of stuff, how do you think that <laughs> two-tier Keir and the Notting Hill Carnival and fit into modern Britain. They can't. If, if Carnival was not a predominantly black event, it would have been cancelled and banned and, and labelled as far-right thuggery. The fact that it's got away with what it's got away with, how many stabbings were there, how many arrests, how many sexual assaults, it was a horrible, horrible event. It should not be happening in this country. Yes, when it was set up originally, it may have been an, a, a kind of event to celebrate diversity, but we don't need to celebrate diversity. Uh, and it's become a riot. It's not a, it's not a festival, it's a riot. And if, if we, you and I were organising it, we would have been in jail. So the fact that the mayor of London says this is a great uh, example of multiculturalism and the fact that the prime minister thinks it's a great element of diversity shows that they are the problem. And actually, we need to get back to celebrating Britain, celebrating England, celebrating the things that unite us, not the things that separate and divide us. And Notting Hill Carnival is a predominantly Afro-Caribbean event in a predominantly white British country. So again, I can see why the reactions come from people like SL who, who say, well, this is, get rid of the black system. We just need to be pure white. Like, I don't, I don't think we can go that far. I don't think that far, that logic makes sense. But at the same time, we have to say, look, our culture is not um, thrusting up against police officers. Our culture is not gyrating in, uh, publicly when children are walking by. Our culture isn't that, that grabby sexual perversion of, of the Afro-Caribbean culture that we see in Notting Hill Carnival. Our culture is not stabbing people that we dislike and, and gang violence. And our culture is, is, is none of the, the peeing on other people's doorsteps. So we have to say, that's not okay. That's inappropriate. Get it out. But, but th then we draw the line there. Is it? I mean, is that specific to Afro Caribbean culture, or is this an example of um, uh, about where diversity is the main problem with diversity? Which is that by saying that diversity is wonderful, and therefore you're essentially saying that you have to take diversity down to the lowest common denominator, right? Which is pedos. You have to include them too. Which you know we've had many chats on that. Is it like you're sort of? you're kind of obligated through your commitment to diversity to celebrate the lowest common denominator and the most degenerate behavior that you can celebrate. So is diversity really just Satanism, just the worship of the most degenerate act that one can fulfill, which I don't think is actually unique in particular to Afro-Caribbean culture necessarily. I think it's particular to the basis of all of our human natures. You know, it's a Jordan Peterson thing of going, don't imagine yourself as Oscar Schindler, imagine yourself as the concentration camp guard. Yeah. Yeah. Is diversity a religion, <clears throat> which is in celebration of depravity and evil, and is the Notting Hill Carnival a celebration of that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I called out a two-tier element of, of Carnival and how it would have been, you know, castigated if, if you and I did it versus how it was celebrated because it was a predominantly black culture that did it. But... The, the fact there that they're celebrating diversity as an idol is, yeah, absolutely a form of, it's demonic, it's Satanism, it's, it's celebrating the things that divide us, and it's celebrating the lowest common denominator, it's celebrating degeneracy and public indecency, all the things that we used to say are bad. And people who responded to my tweet were like, well, they're just having fun, why are you being such a, like, yeah, they are having fun, but they're having a fun in, a, in an inappropriate way. We're not against fun, fun is great, but you don't want people being sexually lewd in front of children, and you don't want violence in the streets surely we can all agree on that having standards is a good thing well i don't think you can have standards in diversity i think diversity means that you as i said before alluded to is like you 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 can't have standards in diversity because diversity means you have to include because it's got the inclusion word in it doesn't right. it you have to include everyone which means including degenerate vile pedophiles and and various things like that and twerking you know, that, that that sort of police officer being twerked up against, you know, you just imagine one someone from Stock Southwell, Stock South Southport Brain, ugh, yeah. um, twerking up against a police officer, they would have been in jail in 30 seconds. Of course they would. So I'm my worry, and it's a major worry now, 
as I look at Keir Starmer, is that we we are getting we're going to have five years of absolute misery mm-hmm. with him. And the best he can come up with is we're going to ban smoking outside pubs. I think he wants to ban smoking outside pubs because he doesn't like pubs because pubs is where people plan. Absolutely. Pubs is where people talk and like churches. When so I, I first moved to the countryside, when I first moved to the countryside years ago, I uh, the, the vicar of the local church, because not that many people went to church, he used to come to the pub yeah. on a Friday instead. And he used to hold the sort of come and speak to me moment. Yeah. And the pub is essentially a kind of, it's a bulwark to the church, isn't it? You know, and it, it seems that he wants to shut down pubs. He wants to shut down, look, he goes 80,000 people a year die from smoking. It's like, yeah, we're allowed to, we're allowed to do it, make yeah. it illegal, but don't stop us from meeting in places where we're going to ban like COVID, like you said, you know, what do you think about that wanker? <laughs> I think it's insane totalitarianism. This idea that oh, this thing is bad for you. Therefore, we're gonna we're gonna ban it entirely. Are they gonna also ban sugar? Are they also gonna ban alcohol? Are we gonna have prohibition again? Of course, we're not. It's stupid. But if you look at his statement when he went on TV, he said it's a preventable cause of death. Well, yes, so is abortion. Two hundred fifty thousand babies die every year of, of a, from abortion. It's the biggest killer we have in in the United Kingdom. Are you going to ban that too? Of course, he's not. It's just political. He's stretching his power. He's stretching his muscles in 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 his uh, number ten office, thinking how can I control the narrative? And you're right that the pubs are one place that we have a say. We have freedom of assembly. It's one of the reasons they closed down the pub straight away in COVID. I remember standing outside a pub with you and uh, Martin Daubney when we first heard we we're going to have some kind of martial law, some kind of shutdown of, of public assembly. It was like something from a horror movie because we couldn't ever imagine something like that happening in a so-called liberal democracy. And, and we've reached a point now where it's, it's actually normalized. And I think we need to get back to common sense and say, well, if someone wants to smoke, let them smoke. We all know what it, what it does. But if people want to enjoy it with moderation, go good, good for them. I want to enjoy a nice cigar in a pub. I want that smoky atmosphere. I want to be able to just sit around with my mates and have a laugh, have a pint and a cigar, and just be like British people used to be. Why is everything dictated to us by the state? They're not in charge. They're not our parents. It's beyond a joke. The Conservatives were just as bad as Labour, though, because they were the ones who brought in the law that said people who are 15 now, by the time they're 18, they won't even be allowed to buy tobacco products. So they'll never in their lifetime be legally allowed to smoke. They're not allowed to make that choice for themselves. It, ma- it makes me want to get my kids into smoking just to. It just makes me to want to take government. up smoking. I don't smoke cigarettes, as you know. It makes me want to start as a re- mm. rebel. In fact, I want to go and st- stand in a pub and smoke and see what they do. It's ridiculous. I, the, the number of cabs, I've, black cabs I've got into go because uh, they know that I smoke these little rollies, which I love. And the number of black cabs I've got into of an evening, you've turned around and gone, you can have a smoke in the back of this, Loz, I don't mind, mate. <laughs> uh, so as, uh, that. it always comes back to the rule that they should vote um, They should vote ahead of us. None but of us he, should be allowed to vote except them. He claimed it was because um, the, the NHS is overburdened. But I looked into this. So in the last year... We've made, from taxes on tobacco, £8.8 billion. Pounds. And the cost on the NHS of, of tobacco-related illness is £2.4 billion. Pounds. So it's actually a net positive for people to smoke. We make more money off it. So that argument doesn't hold up. Neither does the argument of it's a preventable death, because there are certainly more preventable deaths, such as uh, liver, kidney disease and diabetes. But again, they're not going to ban sugar, are they? So it's all, it's all a nonsense. It's all a power play on his part. Yeah, no, no, exactly. Now do diabetes. Now, now do obesity. It's um, it's it's what it is. Is it's moral purity. Mm. And <clears throat> what I hate about what, what, and I really genuinely hate Keir Starmer. Like, I, I disliked him strongly before, but I now hate the guy um, because what he wants to impose, and and it, it's really solidified in this removal of um, Thatcher's portrait from Downing Street. Because you, if you're a coward. It's like, you know, when I first got divorced, I didn't like going back to where I used to live yeah. because I felt like I didn't own it. I didn't have any control over it. It was not. And I, I, I'm sure lots of people have felt like that. They're places where they're bad memories from. Yeah. Now I'm fine. And I go through there and it's like, oh, good. I'm glad I don't live here. But it, for Keir Starmer, what he's doing is he's taking that picture of Margaret Thatcher down because he knows that she's everything that he's never, ever going to be. It's just sad never because 
all the politi- all the prime ministers have their portraits up. It's not a sign of liking their politics or not. It's a sign that they served their country. And so in his short-sightedness, he's not seeing that one day someone might turn around and remove his portrait and remove evidence of him serving his country, which is what he is doing. I don't agree with how he's doing it, but he is the prime minister, so he should have his portrait up in number 10, just as Margaret Thatcher should. But of course, this is a problem with those on the right. We protect everyone's rights, including the, the crazy lefties. They don't do the same when they're in power. No, they don't fight fair. They d- they really don't fight fair. And you know, as we can see, I was I, while we were on holiday, and I know you encountered this conversation as well. Um, you know, the great thing about Skathos is that it's full of people from Hull, and it's full of people, uh, middle class people from Ham- Hammersmith in London. Yeah, yeah. And you do meet a lot of Londoners who yeah. go like, "Oh, Kamala Harris sounds just wonderful as a person." She seems just delightful. She's a woman. She's black. It, I, it's so good. And I just turn around and go, have you heard the moron speak? Yeah, it's not Have you think, heard what actually comes out of her mouth? I think Kamala Putting aside is, what she uh, looks like and what gender she is, have you heard what she says? She's thick as two short blanks. Yeah, she's not and, uh, Yeah. yeah. I, I heard the same thing about Kia, though. Someone said to me, oh, isn't Kia handling the situation really well? Like, oh, Okay. So not everyone's awake. This is serious. Some people think he's doing a good job. That's quite worrying. He's, he's the most tyrannous politician we've had in a long, long time. He, he has no compassion, no emotion. Um, Carl Benjamin just did a segment on, on uh, Lodge Caesars about this, which I think you'll enjoy. He runs through uh, what does Keir Starmer actually believe. There was, he was interviewed. He couldn't give like a, a, an opinion on whether he's an extrovert or an introvert. He couldn't say his favourite poem. He couldn't say what books he'd read. Like He has no emotion, no personality. He's just a communist automaton. Yeah, he's, a, he's a dead leftist. That's what he is. He's a, he, uh, and, that, and that's where I think I've come to now. Um, on the laws of Fox's spiritual journey mm-hmm. is if you do not have faith and you do not believe mm-hmm. you are very open to this, uh, as God said, calls it suicidal empathy of the left mm-hmm. who are terrified of dying. Yeah. And they're terrified of dying so much that they want zero, everything, zero death. We've, we've been through this before. And I think that um, we, we now have an obligation to go to seriously think about what it is that we're going to be able via our network to offer people as an alternative, because I can't see Keir Starmer's uh, regime coming to an end by democratic means. I just don't. I think it's going to, I think it's going to be a mass uprising of people who just either go on a general strike or, you know, they just go, hang on a minute, you just paid off all the doctors, even though you agreed to the pay rise. You just paid off all the, you paid off the entire public sector, of which we all, us who are not employed by the public sector, we pay your pensions, the pension part, which is going to explode in this country and no one wants to talk about it. Uh, the public sector doesn't work at all and we have to pay for it. Mm, that it's going to take the private sector to turn around and go, I'm not, I'm going on strike. Sorry, mate, you're not getting a latte. You're not. You're not getting a latte. This I can't morning. see it happening. I don't. This generation has it in them. I don't. I can't see a general strike. I can't see civil unrest uh, to the extreme in this country. I think most people are still sitting back and letting it all happen, letting themselves be run over by this commie. I hope I'm wrong. I hope people do wake up and stand up, but I'm not seeing it. No. Well, I, so in this quiet, very polite culture that you talk about, yeah. uh, I think what there is and what we're going to do, we, we've got a meeting ourselves later, don't we, with our with our band of undesirables, our sort of pack of cards for the government's want to throw in jail list. Uh, we've got we've got a meeting later about that, and um, I, I think in the politeness of Great Britain and the politeness of all the people here and the fact that we're not those to stand up and, you know, take arms like the French would and build guillotines, we will, we need quiet demonstrations of resistance. And I, I almost think it's got to be like, you know, like the Hong Kongans had a, had a umbrella. Others had different colored flags. I think we need a little badge. Yeah. I think we need our badge and we need to, we need to keep the United Kingdom, uh, message moving forward and I think we need to put a million people on the streets of London that's what I think we need to do what do you think I agree we need to continue the uniting the kingdom movement I agree the badges are a nice idea 
even, I mean, if we manage to get a million people on the street, that'd be fantastic. But even then, I don't see it having much of an impact. When the last time the Labour government were in power, Tony Blair saw a million people on the street for the Million Man March against the illegal war. He still went ahead anyway. These commies don't care. Just, the far left don't care. They'll just continue with their agenda. I don't know how we can stop them. And I suppose we've got all we can do is get ready for the next election. Get ready for five years' time, if and when hopefully an election is called, that we can have an answer to the problem. But who are we voting for? Well, I'll vote for myself. <laughs> You're going to vote for yourself. You're standing, aren't you? Yeah. I'll stand for you, Kip. I'll stand. Um, yeah, good. And if, if you're standing great, you'll get people as well. And we, together, we can all rally the troops. But the Conservatives are not the answer. Labour's the problem. Well, I mean, they're both a problem. So we have to build a movement by the next election. Um, at this point, I think we need to talk about gold. Oh, yeah? What about it? Gold, gold bullion. Yeah? Uh, we need to invest. Gold bullion partners. <laughs> Go on. Gold, gold is actually um, at an all-time high. What's it called? It's called the forever hedge. That's what they call gold. I don't know where the currency is going to exist tomorrow. I, I look at the facial recognition stuff going on in town, the fact that Essex police is saying they're using facial recognition t- technology. I don't know what currency we're going to use when the whole thing turns into a CBDC. I, um, and therefore, I think anyone with half a brain needs to find somewhere to store some gold, don't they? Would it's good to have agree? a backup. No, it's important to have a backup because there is too much authority and power over our own money or what we think is our own money. And I don't trust the banks. I don't trust the government. And I do see CBDCs coming through um, some kind of central bank digital currency, and therefore we'll, they'll have control over everything. So we we need to have some way of maintaining our own independence and privacy as well. Yeah, gold and silver. I like it. The olden days. Let's do it. Anyway, you will find a link in our bio of our, my really badly. Um, well, at least it was authentic. Uh, gold and silver uh, ad for us. So, um, yes, please get involved and buy some and uh, make sure that you're covered when... Uh, and also buy some jerry cans of petrol and a, and a deep freezer and um, a generator and some solar panels and have 48 hours. What's that thing that they do in America? I really want to be sponsored by them, Patriot Supply. Do you ever hear about that one? No, like being a... Yeah, when it's like you can buy like three months worth of food. Right. And it lasts for 25 years. That's important. It's good to be prepared. (laughs) Also, you need your guns. This is what we need. Unfortunately, we have... We can have it on GB2. (laughs) GB2. Okay, we'll have guns on GB2. Why shouldn't you be able to declare a new country? Why shouldn't you be able to do it? What's Scotland going to do? Invade? Hamza Yusuf? I wonder what would yeah, happen what? if someone did say, look, I am conquering this land. Can you imagine? I can't imagine our army being mobilized. I, I imagine the government flopping and say, folding over and saying, oh, well, these people need their own space. Certainly, if we got, if we got in a big shipment of um, AR-15s, from you know some friends over in, in you know we could have surface to air missile turrets. We could it could be great. <laughs> you when was the last time? Leader. When was the last time someone conquered some land? I don't know, but it's, I, I think it's about time we started to reconquer some land because our, our, someone said when was the last time a country was conquered without firing a shot? Uh, no, no, there was a picture of the uh, that huge, huge Asian dude, and the police were trying to beat him up. Did you see that? No. On the internet, yeah. So the police were going, get down. They're like hitting him with buttons, and he just couldn't. And this uh, American tweeter tweeted, um, I seriously reckon I could conquer Britain without firing a shot. And I responded with, 30 years too late, mate. Yeah, quiet, quiet. So, uh, any thoughts on our friend, uh, not our friend, uh, the demonically possessed Axel, and why we've heard nothing more of him and nothing more of his motives for his massacre of children? Any, 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 any thoughts on that? 
Well, I think I said at the time that they're going to try and distract us. Uh, they'll do anything they can to to not talk about the perpetrator. They'll talk about the far right. They'll talk about the riots and protests. They may even talk about the victims, but they won't talk about the perpetrator, who he was, where he came from, what his motivations were. All this time on, we should have a good picture of what, what happened and who it was. Why don't we? Well, because they want to cover it up for the sake of diversity and multiculturalism, which again, are the idols of the liberal elite. So how do we call it out? Say diversity is the enemy. How, how do we get people to understand our middle class friends who think that Kamala Harris is black and a woman, and therefore, well, she's newly black. She used to be brown, so she, yeah, she used, used to be Indian. Indian. She's she's recently transitioned to black. How do we how do we turn around and say it doesn't matter what color your skin is or whether you what whether you're willy or not? It's what's going on in your head and your heart, and your what's going on in her head is la la gu gu ga ga. And what's going on in our heart is pure communism. I don't think we can. I think most people already know that. The people that do believe in diversity, multiculturalism, that's become their faith. I don't think we can break them apart from it unless we give them another faith. So I suppose the, the answer is evangelism, is proselytizing, is bringing people back to Christ. But the vast majority of people, I believe, are already awake to this mess and kind of see it for what it is, as a lie. And they, well, they see it because they feel it in, in their day-to-day -day lives. They feel the, the lack of resources and the, how stretched the NHS is and how overcrowded the schools are and how little money they have in their bank account. So and then they see people coming over illegally, getting put up in a hotel for a while and given a free house and given a free wage, essentially, on benefits for, for, for breaking the law. And then they, so they see that and they balance that against their own lives and they think, well, something's off here. This is ordinary folk. But the elite, we can't really wake the elite up unless we remove their false religion. But I'm talking about, you know, you talk about false religion, but there are actually real religions of which, you know, your new one, has uh, has taken a bit of a bit of a battering recently as um Pope Chill out McChill out, uh the woke Pope has said um I want it's it's a it's morally it's a moral imperative to take in migrants. A man that lives behind yeah. fifty feet walls in the Vatican City. What's oh. what what do you what do you reckon about the woke Pope, Calf? I love that. It's fantastic, isn't it? Those walls were literally built to prevent the Mohammedans from invading the Vatican. And he sits there behind those walls and, and lectures the rest of us that we must take in migrants, otherwise it's a grave sin. That, where does it say that in the Bible? It doesn't, it doesn't say anything about that. It says that... In Deuteronomy, it says the opposite, doesn't it? Well, the whole message of the Bible is that, that nations and tribes are God-ordained. And after the Tower of Babel, which it was demonic, God scattered us in, into our communities. And yes, all of us belong to the, to, to the Big C Church, and the church is broader than nations, but we still live within nations and communities and tribes that are important to us and important to God. He, he specified which tribes are important, actually. And so for the Pope to sit there and say, well, no, you just need to let everyone in, that's promoting globalism that's the opposite of christianity and globalism is evil so it's, it's weird to have a pope do you think he thinks that globalism is the development of christianity that globalism is like the the next moral uh the the sort of moral supersession of christianity that ultimately you know in a world where no one's actually going to believe in jesus christ uh that actually what we should all believe in is globalism instead in order to keep his own job and his own walls up and his own Vatican City and Justin Welby's own silly little Church of England. Do you think that's what they've decided? They just kind of hedged their bets? There is an element of that. There is um, worshipping the institution of the church over recognising the importance of the universal church. So, so kind of making an idol out of... of the Roman Catholic Church, or, or whether it's the Church of England, and wanting to hold on to the power and worldly authority that it, that they've maintained for so long, but they're forgetting that we are the Church. All of us, we make up the Church. Uh, everyone that's baptized in Christ is part of His body, uh, so they don't actually have that much authority because all authority comes from Christ. So, so yeah, there is there's an element of that of, of politici politicization of the Church. But what can you do when you've got commies in charge in both churches? So what would you like to see from our meeting later on? Um, I want a, a set 
date for the next Uniting the Kingdom event, which I think will be fantastic. We'll see more than 100,000 people at the next one, but it will have a different vibe because people have been persecuted for being so-called far right and just expressing opinions in public. So that'll be interesting to see what happens. It'll be nice to have more of the festival stuff, so more music, more poetry, more, you know, just people enjoying themselves in a wholesome family way. Um, it's going to be important to kind of figure out a way of self-policing again because as the event gets bigger that's going to get harder and all that the mainstream media and all the politicians are waiting for is just one instant in order to close the whole thing down and arrest us all despite what happened at Notting Hill Carnival in comparison um, but yeah just keeping the momentum going and keep building on what we've done in the past and make it even bigger and even better and even more wholesome and even more Christ-centered uh, let's get celebrating the Christian values, the British values, and unite the kingdom. Do you think it will put people off to make it explicitly Christian? I don't really care. I think it has to be. <laughs> Love you. I knew you'd say that. It's like, <laughs> I don't really care, Lars, to be honest. It's like, you know. Well, it has to be. Like, not... You have to pick a value set, right? And either you pick the liberal value set, you pick the Mohammedan value set, or you pick the Christian value set. This, Christ this country so far has always picked the Christian value set up until recently, and now it's straddling the other two. So the answer going, to the other two is the first one. I'm going to have lunch with a Muslim man next week who says, seems to share almost all of my values and ideals cool. and is very critical of a lot of Islamic ones. Very good. Does that, so I, I'm really interested in all of this stuff because, you know, I'm a bit of a, as you know, I'm a soppy liberal. So I, um, I'm quite looking forward to that, to like, to hearing, you know, where his faith is grounded and then asking him questions that, you know, I, that no Muslim ever seems to be able to give me an answer to that we talk about all the time. So I wonder if if it is a Christian thing. I mean, it's this difficulty between the Steve Laws thing and the ethnonats. And he, I think he called me a civic civonat or something. I can't remember what he called me, but whatever it means, I'm one of them, apparently, according to him. And his quite large following uh, who don't know me. But I, I don't want it to turn into a a, a sort of a movement. I, I mean, I'm really happy for it to have to be underpinned by Christianity, but I, do you think it has to be a Christian movement? Is that what, I think that's my question. I think it is, yeah. It's a, it's a movement to save Britain, and Britain is a Christian nation, so yeah. I don't think you can separate the two. When we try to separate the two, this is, that's how we get into the mess that we're in right now. And we just latch onto other ideas, and the other ideas are harmful for us. Okay, and what is your, um, what, what are your plans? Are you going to tell us any of your plans yet, or are you just going to grow your beard and look like Lewis Hamilton? So, <laughs> um, so I, I, I'm, I am now talking about the idea that I'm moving away. I haven't said, I haven't announced where I'm moving to yet uh, because that's not, you know, but when, when I can, I will. But I have started to have the conversation now that I am moving away. And as much as I love this great nation, uh, I'm going somewhere else to serve for a while as a full-time parish priest and hopefully kind of to regroup and uh, and to figure out what's going on over here and to kind of, get better resourced for what's to come. Yeah. I, I was, I've suspected it and known it for a while, but I obviously I will miss you loads, but I'm also, I also am of the view that, you know, the it's a particular persecution that you come under in this country, which is you, you don't know it unless a, you know, you or B, you know, the series of persecutions that you're under, you're hated by all of the groups. So it's like you're hated by the right because you are openly Christian and they think that's a bit dodge. You're hated by the diversity crowd because you happen not to think like you're meant to think like a diversity crowd person. Yeah. And you're uh, hated by uh, the middle class racists because the middle class racists are desperate to hang on to their own little jobs. So they will obviously hire a diversity type to fill a position that you would fill in. So I mean, you're 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 in a you're in a position where you you are ultimately politically, you know, you're you're much more of a political refugee than I am. I imagine in a lot of ways. Well, I, I don't know. That's the burden I've been given to bear. It's not. It's not. A, it's not an incredulous one. I, I I think more important than that is that we can't do this on our own. 
And at the moment, there are very, very few of us fighting the good fight. We have to build an army. We have to be stronger. There has to be more people that are awake and prepared and willing to engage in this battle that it is a spiritual battle for the heart of our nation. And most people are still willing to just roll over and let whatever happen, happen. I don't think that's good enough, but we can't do it on our own. We really can't. And that's what it feels like most of the time. There are other places in the world where people are gathering together and are building armies and, and people like you and I would just be one among many. We wouldn't be special. We wouldn't stand out. And that's, that's an important thing. Um, and at the same time here at home, we're under threat from, not just the Mohammedans who've basically put us on a fatwa, um, saying these are the people to kill because they, they hate us, even though we don't hate Mohammedans, we hate the Mohammedan ideology. But on the other hand, it's the government who are enforcing this. They want to lock away. First, they're coming for Tom Robinson, but then they're coming for the rest of us, you and I and Carl Benjamin and everyone else. And what they want to do, and this has been made clear by the politicians and the mainstream media, is they want to lock us up and let the Mohammedans have at us. They've made it very, very... It, not just implicit, but explicitly clear that when we get put away, there are elements waiting for us. And I think that's a very, very dangerous place for a society to be when they want to kind of kill off anyone that doesn't agree with them. Yeah, I agree. I think it couldn't be, it couldn't be bleaker when it comes to that. But, um, and also I know that you're, you're going to succeed hugely uh, in your new place but we have to do fox and fathers we'll have to do them remotely with but yeah. we need to get back onto the cigars sorry i've just been because i got back late last night i'm too exhausted but we'll yeah. get back onto the cigars for them we need to do a couple in the studio before we leave as well yeah i'm in um the lotus eater studio right now which is the only reason i'm not smoking because they're, they're, that's that's the area they're still liberal on <laughs> but yeah we will we'll keep fox and father going whether that means we'll travel to each other or we'll do some remotely but we'll keep it going we'll keep the cigars going and the pipes and it, not, nothing will change in that regard so our audience can be assured that we're, we're going to have this we gonna have this outlet yes and and we're grateful to everyone who joins us every week and sorry we missed you for a bit over the summer but it's my fault for being crap at war skiing and it's Calvin's fault for looking like Lewis Hamilton. So what can I say? <laughs> I haven't got cane rows at least. That's, this is the laugh he does. That's his, I don't like Lawrence laugh. <laughs> well, what can I say? That one. That's the laugh. Right. Any final words, please, Father? Um, I don't think I have any final words other than I just want to make it clear that I'm not running away, not abandoning this nation. I love this nation. I love England. I love Britain. My heart is here and I want it to succeed, but, but it takes more and we, we need more. And so part of our objective for the next five years until the next general election is to wake more people up, get ready and, and create a mass movement, create momentum, create a block vote of Christians, of Brits, of Englishmen who are willing to get rid of the commies and the uni party, get rid of Labour and the Conservatives and vote new to make an actual change in this country, to restore it to its former glory, to make Britain great again. That's exactly right. And, you're, and where you're right is the fact that it's not just a British movement, it's a global movement. It's, a, it's, a, it's civilization against uncivilization. It's yeah. enlightenment versus enlightenment. I know you don't like the enlightenment that much, so I won't no, get into you on that. Enlightenment was a bad thing. All right. <laughs> um, what about you? What are your plans? Um, my plans are to have a nap because I'm so tired, literally, like, yesterday was hell. Yeah. Uh, still waiting for my luggage back. Um, these things happen. Uh, my plan is to set back in to the house, bigot, and uh, I will have a team meeting beginning next week, and we're going to look at the legal case against this, against what the government are doing on free speech again. You know, it, it always boiled down free speech, and it always will. Um I'm I'm all I'm constantly frustrated by the fact that uh you know we are persona non grata with those that seek political legitimacy and and also those that are actually working for the other side pretending to work for our side which oh, is yeah. the, the we're ones that I a, really like. We're going to a wedding this weekend as well aren't we on an on note <laughs> She's very shy though. she won't like it that we're that we're 
saying so she's well, very shy she- what i will say is that marriage is a public office and um it's a ministry where the couple engage uh it's, it's actually a sacrament that you don't necessarily need a priest because the priest doesn't perform the sacrament the husband and the wife performs the sacrament and they commit themselves to each other in front of the community it's an open service and it's a, it's an open celebration it's not a private event uh it's not a secret and that's just the christian way I agree with you. And uh, I know that you're not allowed to marry me and Liz because um, we're both adulterers, apparently, according to you. <laughs> not but according to me, according to the scriptures. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have a blessing and it would be wonderful because uh, at least you are embarking on a commitment to live a lifelong union between one man and one woman, which is a good biblical thing. Well, so yeah, my pa- I think it, my plan is to just, you know resettle in it's like the funny thing about holidays is you go on holiday you come back from holiday and you think where am i and uh, more than ever i've come back to england and gone what is this place that i've come back to so i'm going to sort of get my bearings again reset my little gyroscopes in my head and then i will um then i'll come out punching in the new term but i i i i have a very serious dislike of Keir Starmer a really serious dislike of what he is and what he does and I don't like bullies and he's a bully well I'm going to go and run and get the train so I can meet you in the meeting with the uh, undesirables later this evening but good to see you and um, thank you all for coming back on and tuning back in and so, sorry I've missed you guys I know you, you've missed us as well thank you for tweeting us and, and reminding us and sticking with us God bless you all God bless Love you bro you too, brother.